This video contains spoilers for the second season of the Promised Neverland's anime adaptation. I really liked the first season of the Promised Neverland's anime adaptation. That makes a lot of sense considering that I liked the material it was pulling from and they did a really good job of bringing that to television. So naturally, I was looking forward to the next season. However, I was looking forward to it in a bit of a different way. See, I don't like where the Promised Neverland manga goes. I don't enjoy it at all past a certain point. It's really strong up until about chapter 96, and then it is just downhill from there. In fact, I made a whole video going over the various problems I have with it, and that is a girthy boy. That is a 40 minute long chonker. So yeah, I think from that, you know how many problems I would have with the manga as it goes along. So I was looking forward to this in that I felt that the anime version could easily become the version of choice. Because the manga had a decent framework, but contrivances stacked on contrivances and unsatisfying ends to conflicts resulted in a story that lost me along the way. Basically, my point is that even if I had a whole lot of issues with it, the skeleton of the story was strong, and they could have built on that skeleton to make something fantastic. Just tweak little things here and there, add in some new scenes, expand on stuff that's already there. Stuff like that. If you want to know more of the exact ways that I disliked everything the manga did, you can watch that video. I will also discuss it here, but getting into all of it again would, it would be redundant at this point. So with that out of the way, the key question is simple. Did they do that? Did they make this an adaptation that I'm able to call the definitive version or the better version, or at least the version I personally prefer? As I said, I like the manga up until about chapter 96, meaning that there was still plenty of material for them to cover in this season. In fact, I think there are about 60 chapters left for them to cover before they reach the stuff that I have some issues with. That means that I thought this season would be good. It wouldn't be that hard to make it good. And to be fair, I like the start of it. The first episode had some warning signs attached to it. They were adapting eight chapters in one episode. That is usually a bad thing. But to my own surprise, I thought they did a really good job of it. They intelligently cut out some minor material but kept all the major moments in, and by removing a lot of internal monologuing, were able to fly through material fast. Plus, I've always felt that this section of the story in the forest serves as more of a bridge from Gracefield to the next arc. So if they wanted to do some cuts here and there, this was a smart place to do that. The second episode was similarly well done, despite going through material really fast. Again, all of the key character interactions were kept intact, it deviated from the source material in intelligent ways with really strong storyboarding and direction, the music was good, I was enjoying myself thoroughly. Then there's the third episode. The third episode seems good for the first half of it, and then they get to the underground shelter, which they also get to in the manga. Up until now, things are pretty similar. And then it happens. They go into a room, and it's empty. See, in the manga, there's a character sitting there. A very important character, who's going to lead Emma to an important place that will be central to the next arc of the story. So as soon as he's gone, w what's going to happen next? What's going on? For that episode, I spent my time thinking, oh, maybe they're just going to introduce him a slightly different way, maybe he'll appear, come down into the shelter afterwards. I don't know, just something like that, but... No. They straight up erased him. And if you're an anime only, you have no idea who I'm even talking about. On top of this, this means that they cut out one of my favorite villains in the whole series. And at this point, it makes sense that you might be thinking, oh, that means that this is just a totally different story now. But that's not quite right. See, I've seen a lot of people making comparisons between this and Fullmetal Alchemist 2003. But that comparison is very weird to me. For those who don't know, Fullmetal Alchemist 2003 was the first adaptation of the manga of the same name. That adaptation went up to a certain point following the manga pretty closely, and then it had to deviate because the creators of the anime caught up to the manga and there was no more material left to adapt. So instead of adding in filler and waiting for the source material or just stopping the adaptation right then and there, they decided to go in a totally different direction. As such, by the end of 2003, it doesn't even remotely resemble the end of the manga. These are basically totally different stories that have similar beginnings. Then Brotherhood came out about five years later. 
Brotherhood was there to serve as an adaptation of the manga, including the end of it and the second half. So when people make comparisons between that and The Promised Neverland, they're insinuating that this is a totally different story. This is new. But no, it is not new. Because somehow, despite cutting all of this stuff out, it still has the same basic story structure? See, the anime cuts out multiple arcs, including one of the best ones, to jump forward, and it continues to follow the basic plot of the manga despite its various deviations. It's more like a lot of the major moments are kept intact, but they've been removed from their context and placed elsewhere. So in the manga, Norman also comes back at a later point with a plan to kill all the demons. However, he doesn't just happen to run into Emma and Ray and the other kids in this demon town. In the manga, Norman carries out his plan despite telling Emma he'll wait, but there he goes up against the nobles. In the manga, the kids have to return to Gracefield, but it's because a whole bunch of other children have been taken there, not because they have a radio and are told Phil and the others are being shipped out. In the manga, it's revealed that Isabel convinced the other sisters to betray Peter Rattray and help the kids, but she doesn't get to go to the human world. See what I mean? These are major beats in the story, and they're from the manga, but there's all this other stuff that's missing. After all, the manga is a little over 180 chapters long. So, there's no way they could have got through all of that stuff in this amount of time. Now, I want to be clear about my opinion here for those of you who didn't watch my other video. The manga is full of problems. Frankly, I hate the direction it went in and how it handled its story. I've seen a lot of people using this as an opportunity to say, go read the manga, the manga's way better. Even though a lot of people who read the manga have significant issues with it, including me. I'm not saying you shouldn't give it a shot if you're curious. I'm just saying that these two stories are still very similar in a lot of ways. This also means that I don't even really want to go into what they cut out too much because if you're looking to read the manga and you don't want spoilers, there's a lot of little surprises and things for you there and even if I personally didn't like it, that doesn't mean that I feel okay just ruining it for someone else. So this comparison, this anime versus manga video, it's way different from any other one I've had to make. If it was a little bit more different, I wouldn't even be comparing them. But they're similar enough that it's worth comparing, but there's a whole lot of stuff I don't want to cover. It's weird. Oddly enough though, some of the decisions made here in the anime would work as wonderful expansions to the source material. For example, one complaint I had with the manga was that we didn't get to see enough of the kids in the shelter. We were told it was their home, we were told it was important to them, but yeah, we didn't get much time there. Here we get more of their life in the shelter. It feels like home. Another complaint of mine was that the children other than Emma, Ray, Dawn, and Gilda never felt all that important. But here, a few of them get more focus. I also didn't like how little time was spent in the demon society in the manga, considering that Emma's time there would serve as a major reason why she doesn't want to kill the demons. But here we get to see this old demon, we get to see demons desperately trying to save their family by getting them human meat, and it makes the demon's struggles feel way more real. This all sounds fine and dandy, but there is a big problem. The changes they've made introduce a slew of problems unique to the anime. The main problem is that there are loads of contrivances that weren't in the manga. Now, the manga also has loads of contrivances that aren't in the anime, but the density of them is even worse here, and some of them are even more ridiculous in the anime. I already mentioned Norman happening to run into Emma and Ray in the demon town, which sure is convenient and anticlimactic, but the biggest, most ridiculous contrivance comes with this old demon, who's an anime original character. This guy apparently happened to run into a human 15 years ago who had this pen that could help these kids now, and it happens to contain the blueprints for Grace Field, which, whoa, that's just where they need to go now. Also, Norman and some of these other characters have some sort of fatal illness, so how are they going to deal with that? That's sure a problem, but no need to worry, because this pen tells them how to cure it, baby. This moment alone absolutely ruined the season for me. I was laughing when I watched it because it was so ridiculous. It's such an insane, random, stupid moment, especially in a show where the first season was based on careful planning and mind games. The manga had its own problems with anti-climaxes and contrived events, but this right here, this is way worse than any of that. Of course, then there are the various moments where random elements like demons swoop in at the very last second to happen and save the kids and it's just all so convenient. How am I supposed to get invested in any of the story stakes if I know someone will just swoop in at the last moment to save the day? The manga also had an issue where, at a point, every character started listening to Emma without pushback. As such, it felt like everyone surrounding Emma lacked a will or personality of their own. 
It also made every conflict feel like it was set to easy mode because Emma could just open those old lips and start flapping them and everyone would listen. But despite deviating, that issue carries over here as well. When all the kids agree that they want to kill all the demons, and apparently Emma and Rei are the only ones who think of Sanju and Mujika's existence. So then she goes and tells them, guys, you know, I don't want to kill the demons, that, that's not my style. And they all just change their minds so easily. Beyond that, when Emma convinces Norman to not kill the demons, she also convinces all of Norman's confidants in both versions, which I never for a second bought. After all, we got a whole scene showing how much they hate the demons, regardless of if you find their change of heart believable or not. It sucks so much tension out of the story, and that is absolutely a problem in both versions. However, instead of treating this adaptation as an opportunity to fix these problems, the adaptation leans into those issues. And it does that while also cutting out some of the best stuff. I mean, at least the manga didn't have this ridiculous moment where Norman happens to run into the old man demon whose child is named Emma, which causes Norman to doubt his resolve, and then Emma happens to show up at just the right moment to stop him from killing the kid, and what is even going on anymore with this show? But the ending. Oh boy. The ending's even weirder. So during this time, the show has cut out a whole lot of references to this sort of god character. We never get a name for him. I call him Mr. Scribbles because of how they write his name in the manga. They also cut out a lot of references to the demon nobles, who are major villains in the manga. That led me to believe that they were just leaving that stuff at the wayside to try to get to the end. And yet, they appear in the final episode. But not in any sort of substantial way. They appear in what basically amounts to a PowerPoint presentation, a slideshow of still images showing Emma, Ray, and some other characters going around and doing stuff, and the images they show are from arcs in the manga? That they skipped? So, they went back now to put that stuff in? I genuinely don't know what's going on at this point. This moment is so strange, and it really brings a lot of stuff into question. The main question being, what happened? How did we get here? What went on with this adaptation? And the fact of the matter is, I don't know, but I'm sure that the people making it aren't happy either. To me, this reeks of corporate meddling or something like that. I don't think anyone went into this wanting to make this version of the story. I could be wrong, I have no proof of that, but it's so jumbled and strange and poorly conceived that I don't know it feels like this can't possibly be anything approximating what they wanted it to be when they started making this second season all in all I know that this anime versus manga video has been relatively disorganized for me normally I try to compare things pretty carefully but this is such a strange adaptation that that makes it uh, difficult for me to do it the way I normally do it basically this video is disorganized but nowhere near as disorganized as the anime. So with that being said, I can confidently say that season two of The Promised Neverland is one of the worst anime adaptations I've ever seen. It doesn't deviate enough to become its own thing that might be enjoyed even if it's different from the manga, yet it still deviates enough that you might want to read the manga to get some of the arcs they skipped. It rushes through events, tacks them on at the last minute in a slideshow, which I've never ever seen before in any adaptation. I went into this hoping this would be the ideal version of the story by the end of it, even if it took a lot of time to adapt it, and that's not the case at all. This is really bad, <laughs> really terrible, worse than I imagined it would ever get. I'm sorry to the people who worked on this and had it turn out a way I'm sure they didn't want it to, and I hope they can make something better in the future. And I hope I never have to sit through an adaptation of an anime that is this badly done again.